welcome back. In this section, we're going to learn about the three accessory organs that are located in the abdominal cavity because they all have um, secretions that go into the small intestine, which we've already covered. So the first of these organs is the liver, and the liver is the largest organ inside your body. It weighs several pounds. It's located in the right upper quadrant of your abdomen, just tucked underneath the diaphragm, and it does extend across the midline. If you take a deep breath, the lower edge of the liver will protrude slightly lower than your ribs and you should be able to feel the edge of this and this is what your doctor is checking for in a physical examination. So here is what the liver looks like in all its glory. It is a brownish color because it has a lot of blood and blood breakdown products as well as bile in there and that kind of gives it its typical color and it's very solid. And it smells kind of minerally because it contains a lot of iron in it. When you're looking at this superior anterior surface of the liver, you can kind of see this ligament here, which is dividing it into two uneven parts. And this is called the falciform ligament. And what this is, this basically is a piece of mesentery which attaches it to the diaphragm and the inside of the anterior abdominal wall so we cannot go flopping around in your body. Now, if you look at the edge of this falciform ligament, this part is known as the round ligament of the liver, also known as the ligamentum teres. And this is the remnant of when the umbilical vein came in and then dropped that arterial blood into the ductus venosus going into the inferior vena cava. Um, and then tucked under the right side of the liver, there is the gallbladder, which in this particular picture is not greenish looking at all. So that falciform ligament divides the liver anteriorly into two large lobes. Well, it divides into two large lobes, both anterior and posterior. So on the right side of it, you have the right lobe, and on the left side, of it, you have the left lobe. But if you take the liver and look at it from behind, oh, and by the way, this white structure up here, this is your diaphragm. So it's showing how that falciform ligament is attached to the diaphragm. So looking at the liver posteriorly, you still can see a smaller left lobe and a huge right lobe, but then we also have blood vessels and the gallbladder, which kind of give this middle no man's land which has been divided into two smaller lobes. Up above, you have the caudate lobe, and down below, you have the quadrate lobe. Quadrate, because it's kind of four-sided, and caudate just means it's closer to the head. And so we really do have four lobes of the liver, but they are not equal to each other. And the caudate and the quadrate lobes, they are all going to be draining everything into the right lobe. So the right lobe is the, really the dominant lobe of the liver. Just to refresh your memory about the hepatic portal system, this was this H shape or chair shaped venous uh, blood that traveled from the digestive tract to the liver and it enters the liver through the structure known as the hepatic portal vein. So it's very nutrient rich, it's oxygen poor and it may contain toxins that blood will go through the liver and then will eventually exit from the liver from hepatic veins that drain into the inferior vena cava. So looking at the circulation of the liver in a little bit more detail, going into the liver, we have two different blood vessels. The first is the hepatic artery because this is the liver's source of oxygenated blood. However, most organs have arteries, that's 100% of the incoming blood, but in the liver, it's only 25% of the incoming blood. The other 75% is the venous blood that is coming through the hepatic portal vein. So the hepatic portal vein is quite large in real life. In fact, it's the second largest vein in your body with the first largest vein being the inferior vena cava. So a lot of your blood flow flows through the hepatic portal vein. 
and then exiting out of the liver once again the hepatic vein and this is the last blood vessel that drains into the inferior vena cava it's right below the diaphragm and then right above the diaphragm the inferior vena cava is dumping into the inferior portion of the right atrium so functions of the liver so this is a scanning electromicrograph of up close of the liver. So when we're done talking about the microanatomy of the liver, come on back and see what you can label and identify on this picture. You should be pretty good by then. So the liver is going to detoxify blood as we talked about, because why else would we be sending toxins there? We've also talked about storage of 48 hours worth of glycogen as an energy source, and it's gonna store some vitamins as well as iron. This is where the vast majority of your plasma proteins are made, but it also makes all the cholesterol you need. You do not need to eat any dietary cholesterol. Remember, dietary cholesterol only comes from animal products, so this is why vegetarians are just fine, because their liver can make the rest of the cholesterol that they need. Um, also is where bile salts and vitamin K are produced, and what we're going to be talking more about, this is where bile is made and excreted from. So looking at the liver histologically, the structural and functional unit of the liver is a liver lobule. And your liver has about a hundred thousands of them and they are not perfectly hexagonal like a stop sign, but they're kind of slightly on oval hexagonal, so they're either one to two millimeters in size. And so there's a cartoon drawing on the top, and then there's a photo micrograph on the bottom where you can clearly see the shape of the liver lobule. And it has that central hole area, which we're going to talk about shortly. So this is what a liver lobule looks like in 3D. And so if we look at all the corners, at all the corners you have these three structures. You have this red, this green, and this blue structure. And this group of three is called the portal triad. And what these structures are, the blue one is a branch of the hepatic portal vein bringing blood into the lobule. The red one is a little branch of the hepatic artery bringing oxygenated blood into the liver lobule to feed the cells. And the bile duct is the little green structure which is taking bile out of the liver lobule to go into the bile duct. So that's what's happening at the corners. Now all the blood that is entering, whether from artery or part of the hepatic porta vein, traverses between the liver cells to get to this central area right there in the middle of the lobule where we have a vein. Um, so before we get there, I apologize. Here is a photomicrograph of a portal triad. So take a moment and look at the structures there. Going back to the vein in the center of the liver lobule, that is called the central vein. And all the central veins will coalesce and join other central veins and form bigger and bigger veins until eventually they get to hepatic veins draining the liver into the inferior vena cava. So let's put those hepatocytes to work and let's talk about what is in the liver lobule itself and what is going on the first thing when we look at the picture you clearly can see the portal triad on the side and the central vein in the middle and then radiating out like the sun's rays from the central veins towards the portal triads are those brown cells which are hepatocytes so hepatocytes are not stacked up like skeletal muscle and smooth muscle cells were stacked up, but these instead are radiating out from a central vein area. And if you notice, the hepatocytes are never more than about two layers thick, and that's because they want to be next to the blood so they can do their work. They do have little microvilli so they can absorb stuff, and they do produce bile, so you can see these tiny little bioconiculi between the layers of hepatocytes, which is draining the drops of blood into the little bile ductules. The next structure that's between hepatocytes are these purple structures. And the reason why they color them purple is because they're containing deoxygenated blood coming from the branch of the hepatic portal vein, 
as well as the oxygenated blood coming from the branch of the hepatic artery. So they want you to realize that this is not venous blood, nor is it arterial blood. It's a combination of the two. So it has this mixed blood. And it's called a sinusoid because it's like a sinusoidal capillary in that the endothelial layer has these fenestrations in it so that cells and things can cross if they need to. In the fetus, this was an important site of hematopoiesis, but in the adult, it is not. Cruising up and down the hepatic sinusoids are these yellow cells with their little projections. And these came from monocytes and they are known as Kufer cells. So they are the macrophages cruising up and down the sinusoids in case there was stuff, particularly in the um, venous blood coming through the hepatic portal vein that needs to undergo phagos phagocytosis, trying to keep you healthy. In case any bacteria got into that blood, the liver wants to stop it before it gets to the heart. So here are two photomicrographs of this with some things labeled. So definitely stop the video and look and make sure that you understand the arrangement of what is in a liver lobule and then go back to that scanning electron micrograph and see how well you do there as well. All right. Now that you've done that, I have some more things for you to try to test yourself on your knowledge. The first one is a picture of liver where I have labeled a bunch of different blood vessels. These are all blood vessels, so be sure you label them. And then down here in the bottom part, this is microanatomy of the liver. So go ahead and work through these and see how you do. So let's talk about bile. Okay, so this is made by this hepatocytes. And when it's made in the liver, it's this bright yellow color. Okay? And it's almost all water, but it's the stuff that's not water that's super important. Tiny bit of cholesterol, because as I said, the liver makes cholesterol you need. But it has bile salts as well as those breakdown products of the erythrocytes known as bilirubin. And here's what bile does. It emulsifies fat. And you're going, well, that's great if I knew what that word emulsification meant. And so emulsification is what you do when you take a salad dressing and you can see we've got the vinegar, we've got the oil and they're not mixing and you're shaking it up. And so you end up with all these tiny little fat globules. So in other words, it's kind of mechanically digesting lipids so that we have all this surface area that the chemicals, the enzymes can work on to chemically digest it. So bile emulsifies fat. So it's made in the liver, and if it's not needed right away, as in you are not eating something, it's going to go to the liver where it gets stored and concentrated, and it changes color, and it turns more into this yellowish green color because some of that water gets sucked out, and it makes the colors more intense. Now, if you got too much cholesterol or too much bleeding, so you got too much bilirubin going on, you can end up with different kinds of gallstones and you can end up with one big one or some big ones or some little ones. And like, even though the big ones are impressive, the little ones are more dangerous to your health because they can get into your, your biliary tree. <coughs> anyway, not gonna talk about bile stones. I just put pictures of various kinds of bile stones there just so you can see what they actually look like. <clears throat> this slide is one that you should walk yourself through again because this is reviewing what is going to give us bile projection and what all the various stimuli are because as I say you cannot go through this too many times the more repetition you have the more likely you are to pick up more and more concepts and to get it without having to overtly memorize it so make sure you understand what's going on here. We've covered it before several times already. So let's talk about the biliary tree. So up there in the liver, in the right and the left lobes of the liver, you can see that those bile ductures are coalescing and they're forming all different kinds of bile ducts, which eventually are going to merge into two main ones, which exit the liver. 
And so that gives us our biliary tree, which is better represented in this blown up picture where this is the portion that I'm circling right now is this portion that is up here on the liver. We have our gallbladder with its duct. We have the pancreas tucked into the C-shaped part of the duodenum. So draining the right lobe of the liver, we have the right hepatic duct and draining the left lobe, we have the left hepatic duct. And at some point, the two will combine to form the common hepatic duct. And getting bile into and out of the gallbladder, the gallbladder has its own duct known as the cystic duct. From the point where the cystic duct joins the common bile duct, below that the bile duct now has a new name, sorry, where it joins the common hepatic duct. Below that it has a new name known as the common bile duct. And the common bile duct in the head of the pancreas is going to join up with the main pancreatic duct. Notice not the accessory one, but the main pancreatic duct and the two together will have their secretions enter into the duodenum. And so this is showing the gallbladder with the cystic duct. This is the common hepatic duct. Then this would be the common bile duct. There's the main pancreatic duct, and the two are going to be jumping in together. And this is a better picture taken from the inside of the duodenum, and you can see a drop of that bile stuff coming in through that opening known as the ampulla or septa. Now, this is how we have you learn it because this is by far the most common arrangement. But I want you to realize just like everybody's nose kind of has the same arrangement, but nobody's nose looks like anybody else's nose, there's a lot of variability in the biliary tree. So let me show you some examples of that, but you don't have to learn that. For instance, in the liver, the way all those intrahepatic bile ductures attach, there's a lot of variability, and sometimes you have three main bile ducts coming out of the liver. And then once it's outside of the liver, where that gallbladder and the cystic duct choose to attach can create havoc for many a surgeon. So as you can see, when you put both of these together, we have a ton of variability, so much for that. Even though what we taught you is the most common, it's actually in less than 50% but it is the most common. All right, continuing on to the pancreas. So notice you have the common bile duct entering the head of the pancreas. The pancreas is a retroperitoneal organ. It has a main pancreatic duct that has endocrine glands dumping into it. If we look on the posterior aspect of the pancreas, that is where you clearly can see the common bile duct joining into the head of the pancreas to meet up with the main pancreatic duct at the ampulla of water. So the pancreas is going to do its secretions when it's stimulated by food you eat. Otherwise, the pancreas is not doing a bunch of secretions. The liver, however, is making bile 24-7. So the bile is constantly being produced, but this ampulla of water regulates the flow of bile into the duodenum. If there's no food in the small intestine, then this sphincter here at the ampulla of water is closed. And so then bile backs up through the common hepatic duct, through the cystic duct, and gets stored in the gallbladder. As soon as food enters here again, this will open and bile will pour down and join the pancreatic juices in the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. So let's talk about those pancreatic secretions. We are not talking the endocrine function, and now we are talking the exocrine function, where we have glands with their secretions and the vesicles being released into little ducts which coalesce into the, either the main or accessory pancreatic duct. So to refresh your memory, everything in the box here we have had twice already about how hydrochloric acid in the duodenum is going to make secretin being produced by the duodenum. Protein and fat's gonna make cholecystokinin being produced, and both of those will have something to do with pancreatic juices, although they do different things, which we will see on the next slide.
So in addition to the secretin and the cholecystokinin, I want to refresh your memory, that vagal stimulation, the vagus nerve, just thinking about food is enough for your pancreas to start secreting in anticipation of that lovely meal you're going to be eating. So pancreatic juices, what are they and what do they do? The first thing in pancreatic juice, secretin, causes the release of sodium bicarbonate, okay? So this has a high pH, it's alkaline, so we are trying to bring that acidic kind with its low pH back up towards neutral. Because even though the duodenum does have some goblet cells, it doesn't have nearly the amount of goblet cells that the stomach has, so we don't have that whole millimeter or so thickness. So we need to help it a lot by secreting a bunch of bicarbonate solution. Vagal stimulation and CCK will trigger the release of enzymes and some proenzymes. So proenzymes are something that has to be acted on and then it becomes the active enzyme, otherwise it doesn't do its job. So an example of an enzyme that is released by both is lipase. So lipase, ACE acts on, look at what the root is, LIP, lipids. So lipases are gonna digest your lipids, AKA your fats and your oils, the net result of which you're going to have glycerol and fatty acids, and those can be absorbed through your lacteals in your villi. In addition to lipase, you're going to have amylase again, because remember, we only had like a minute's worth of amylase before, so not that much carbohydrate digestion. So more than 90% of your amylase comes from your pancreas. So this is the important part that is going to give us the carbohydrate digestion so we can absorb your simple sugars and including your glucose molecules into the capillary system in the villi. Trypsin comes into play and trypsin is a protease, which is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. And so once again, we would have amino acids that can be absorbed into the blood capillaries. And trypsin is interesting in that once it starts producing and breaking down proteins that has positive feedback. So you get more and more trypsin. And trypsin is also important because of some proenzymes that are secreted. Chymotrypsin can carboxypeptidase, which are not activated until they encounter trypsin and then they can do their job. So as you can see, if you want to digest food, the job belongs to your pancreas. And your pancreas is the only source of anything that digests lipids. So if you had pancreatic dysfunction, then your stool would be floating and you would have greasy rims in your toilet and it'd be really gross and difficult to clean. This is where most of our carbohydrate digestion is gonna come through and protein digestion as well. And so all of this is being dumped into the duodenum along with the bile to emulsify those lipids so the lipase can work on it. And so now you hopefully understand why the small intestine is the major source of digestion and then gonna be absorption, especially the jejunum. And with that, we are done with this accessory organs, and I will see you soon for the last video on the digestive system. Thank you for your work, and make sure you're understanding all these different um, organs and what they actually do.